Hi, this video will cover the Sumerian and Akkadian periods of the ancient Near East. Uh, we'll be covering some sites in ancient Sumer and then moving on to the Akkadian dynasty and looking at the stele of Naram Sin. Uh, so starting off with Sumer, Sumer was organized into city-states, which meant that eventually it became uh, quite easy to conquer because it was so divided. Uh, each city-state usually had one or two patron gods or goddesses uh, for whom there would be ziggurats with temples on top constructed, and these were sites where the citizens would bring their contributions to the temple complexes. Uh, so these contributions made up an important part of city life. And we will look at Uruk first, which is modern Warka, as one of the earliest cities. So there uh, is a ziggurat complex that survives in somewhat poor shape um, that was probably dedicated to the sky god Anu. And then there are also a number of uh, works, sculptures, vessels that survive from uh, Uruk that unfortunately a number of them were taken from the Baghdad Museum but a lot of them have been returned so we'll look at one of the examples of a work that was taken from the Baghdad Museum. Uh, so Uruk was established around 3500 BCE so quite early and this uh, will be one of the first sites we'll think about. Just looking at the map, Sumer is down in this area, and then when we move up to the Akkadian dynasty, I'm not sure of the exact site of the capital, but a little bit farther to the north and west of Sumer, so over this way, uh, in between the two rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates here. And of course, previously we were in Egypt, which is over in this area. All right, so starting off, looking at the Warka vase, what I'm showing you here is uh, the alabaster vase on one side and then a rollout so that you can see all the registers of the vessel. So starting off, you have um, kind of stylized plants, then a row of animals, and then a row of nude figures in composite view. So uh, their faces are profiled, their shoulders are slightly facing forward, and then their their um, legs are pretty much in profile, um, but they've stripped down and they're bringing a variety of offerings up to probably the temple complex, the ziggurat temple complex, giving us an idea of what these offerings were like. So you can see these figures all holding different vessels and then in the rollout as well. You can see also this vessels in um, fairly fragmentary condition and that this portion is filled in so a lot of it is uh, guessed by art historians and archaeologists it's an hypothesis as to what was represented there based on what survives uh, as I mentioned, uh, some of these were stolen from the Baghdad Museum in uh, 2003, and this was one of these, uh, one of the examples that was taken. It was actually ripped from its pedestal, but luckily it was eventually returned. Um, this one gives us a nice sense, as I said, of the offerings, and then the top register gives us a sense of how these offerings accumulated here on this side. Um, this is probably a priestess who's receiving the offerings, or it could be uh, an appearance of the goddess herself. Here you have another figure bringing an offering directly in front of her, and then you also have what's probably the ruler of Warka or Uruk, uh, the ruler who's wearing this kind of cap that we associate with uh, rulers in the ancient Near East in a number of cases. Uh, he seems to be joining together with either the priestess or this appearance of the goddess in some kind of ritual or ceremony. And he's the only figure that is as tall as the goddess, so clearly he's an individual of high status. Um, the goddess is clearly the main attraction, however. Um, all of the offerings are behind her. The goddess or the priestess is the main attraction. All of the offerings are behind her, and there are a number of markers of status, just in terms of her dress, her headdress, um, lots of markers of her importance. But clearly the two most important, the goddess, and then this figure here, probably the leader. Uh, another work of art from ancient Sumer is the Victory Stele of Ianatum, and this gives us a sense of the military, uh, the, the military action that was going on in the ancient Near East. And this Victory Stele commemorates a victory of this ruler. Um, he was the ruler of Lagash, and he was a figure that claimed connections to the divine, which 
we can see in the writing on the fragments of the stele, but also on the iconography itself. The iconography tells us that he believed that a god came and assisted him in this battle. Um, so first off, it's pretty easy to spot Ianatum. You can see him here. He's clearly differentiated by his fancy garment. Um, you can see this kind of sash extending across. He has a bun in his hair, which a lot of rulers did in the ancient Near East. Um, he's separated from his troops, which are following close behind him. He's not that much taller than they are, but we definitely can tell that he's an individual of significance. Um, also down below, he's slightly higher than his troops and his in his chariot. Um, you can see he has a helmet on, the bun is again visible, his arm is raised, and again his troops are very tightly packed behind him. So clearly an individual of high status, it's pretty easy to spot him, um, but he, he is about the same height as they are. Um, his overall physical prowess is not as large as we'll see later on in the Akkadian rulers. Um, just to show you the overall stele, it is extremely fragmentary. That's the piece we were just looking at earlier. So you can see that's Ianatum, that's Ianatum with his troops behind in each case. Um, sometimes this is called the stele of the vultures because there's vultures running off with body parts of the individuals that they've defeated. And then a great part right here on the stele is the god who is assisting uh, Ianatum by bagging up some of his enemies here in this kind of netted bag and kind of bopping one on the head. And he's clearly a god, a figure of um, great kind of physical prowess, a very long beard, which was a sign of masculinity and power in the ancient Near East. Uh, another finding, one of the most famous finds from the Sumerian period, comes from the Royal Cemeteries at Ur, which was a very famous uh, excavation project. And the standard of Ur was probably not a military standard. A standard would be something placed on top of a pole and then carried into battle. Um, this is relatively small. It's really small. And so uh, probably part of a musical instrument or some kind of a decorative feature that was somehow incorporated into the cemeteries. Uh, but what's interesting is the way the scenes are organized and also the information it tells us both about um, battle and also about peace in the Sumerian culture. So first off, we're looking at the peace side. You can clearly see there's a figure who is the leader, his figure, his uh, head rather, breaks the register here. So you can see his head kind of cracking through the register. Um, He's seated, so you can tell he's a figure of status. There are a number of other figures of status, however, that are all seated with him, seemingly in some kind of banqueting environment. They're all holding um, vessels or cups in their hands. They are enjoying lovely music here. This is a bullheaded lyre or a harp which is another type of discovery that has been made in the royal cemeteries at Ur. Um, so the highest register is definitely one that holds the most power in terms of power figures. Um, along the way here you have animals being led, led along, um, so kind of showing a harmonious society. On the war side, however, we see a very different scene. Um, we see captives being led, these are the captives here, here, and also here, um, being led by individuals in military garb, and these captives are being presented probably to that same ruler. We see him again, or we see a similar figure whose head cracks through or breaks through the register. Um, he's clearly come off of his chariot, which is here, um, kind of disembarked, and then come to see these captives that are being presented to him. What we can tell from this is a little bit about the chariots. So the chariots would have had solid wheels, which would have been extremely heavy. Uh, so there weren't spokes at this time to lighten the, the wheels. We can see these same kind of solid wheels down below. We can kind of only imagine how clunky they would be. And we get a sense of the power of this culture and the defeat of their enemies, because you can see it starts off kind of slowly here. And then it kind of starts to pick up speed as these um, donkeys or whatever kind of horses they are um, start to go faster and faster um, with their legs kind of spreading. And then you can see the captives down below here underneath these uh, animals. And so it gives us a sense of a bit of the violence and how captives were treated and how um, showing dominance was very important at this time. And the last culture we will cover in this video um, is this Akkadian dynasty that begins to take control of the area of the ancient Near East. Um, the first 
of strong ruler that we see is Sargon, and he rules for over 50 years. As I said, the city is, the location of the city is unknown. Um, they spoke a different language than the Sumerians, but they still use the same cuneiform characters. So that's something significant to mention that we're still seeing um, cuneiform in both cultures, however, the language is different. So we do have a writing system in both cultures, um, unlike the previous Paleolithic or Neolithic cultures that we saw. And the kingship here is even more connected to the divine and is considered even more powerful than we saw in ancient Sumer. So even though individuals like Eonatum definitely tried to connect themselves to the divine, we see it uh, at an even higher level in the Akkadian period. So focusing in on the victory stele of Naram Sin, we see some changes from the Sumerian period. So first off, we see Naram Sin as a real dominant figure here, um, really towering over the entire group. No longer is the stele divided up into registers. We see all these figures um, kind of slowly moving up this mountainside, gazing up towards their leader and up towards at least three uh, stars that seem to be at least granting them favor or kind of looking, they're looking up at them and they're reading this as a favorable sign. Um, we clearly can see that this is commemorating a victory of Naram Sins. Uh, he defeated a people in uh, the Iranian mountains. It's clearly a mountain. You can see that here. And you can see individuals, um, one has a spear here, one seems to be begging for mercy, and then a couple of them are toppling off the mountain itself. So we can definitely tell that Naram Sin is a figure to be reckoned with, that we have a new type of kingship here. Um, he has horns on his helmet, which is a sign that has been previously associated with divinity. He's very masculine with his beard. He has a bead around his neck to protect him. Um, so Naram Sin is clearly a dominant figure and an important figure uh, in this period. So this would serve as a marker of his victory. Uh, it would bring admiration to his rule or for his rule and uh, it includes inscriptions as well. Eventually it was taken away as a war booty and brought to Iran, so uh, it, is, it was not discovered in its original location. Uh, and the next video will discuss the second part of the Near Eastern cultures.